after the last several lectures, we've taken our genomes, made them into RNA, allowed epigenetics to dictate the extent to which that RNA is transcribed, translated that RNA into protein, and now we're going to address the question of how do those proteins that have been translated make their way to the appropriate locations inside the cell or outside of the cell. This lecture, overall, we're calling prote protein trafficking, and the uh, dis disorder that we'll be speaking about is Noonan syndrome. This disorder is congenital. Congenital means you're born with it. Uh, and it's a developmental disorder with multiple symptoms. A few Noonan syndrome cases on the right-hand side to illustrate the points. Macrocephaly. When Dr. Potter talked about Down syndrome uh, in the last class, talked about brachycephaly, small heads. Macrocephaly, larger uh, than average heads for stature and size. Hypertelorism. These are eyes set further apart on the face, as well as short webbed necks down on this part of the neck. The incidence of Noonan syndrome is uh, a few thousand, a one per few thousand live births. To contextualize that, this is on the order of cystic fibrosis. And the etiology, some of these things are blue, you already know what they mean because we talked about them earlier in the class, uh, relates to defects in a specific signaling cascade that we'll talk about in more detail when discussing cell cycle and cancer at the very end of the semester. We're going to give a preview of this and need to know uh, for today's lecture of this cascade called the RAS MAP kinase cascade, or RAS MAP K. Now, in spite of these developmental sy uh, symptoms, one can see them uh, in individuals with the, the syndrome, um, the phenotypes are remarkably mild when you get an understanding of what the signaling disorder is in these individuals. There are also cardiac complications associated in Noonan syndrome patients. Those can be treated pharmacologically. Uh, and in fact, individuals with Noonan syndrome can live to uh, in, into old age now, as long as the cardiac uh, complications are treated. Let's give a brief prelude to this signaling cascade to um, give you the prior information that you need to be able to understand what we'll be discussing today, and then set the stage for what we'll, we'll be talking about in greater detail after metabolism. The RASMAP kinase signaling cascade is called a cascade because there are a series of events post-translational modifications that occur in different categories of biomolecules, some of which you've heard about in other settings as far as the categories of them. But they're configured in a particular way here that you haven't seen before. This cascade starts from the top, and it starts with a, a special type of G protein, so GTP binding uh, protein called RAS. We discussed heterotrimeric G proteins before. It's in the same category. I'll touch on briefly what the distinction is between the two. But the GTP loading of RAS is the trigger for the RAS MAP kinase cascade. And when RAS becomes activated, it will allosterically activate a protein kinase that phosphorylates proteins on serines and threonines called RAF. And the major substrate of RAF is another protein kinase that has dual specificity. It phosphorylates threonines and tyrosines. That dual specificity kinase is called MEC. And MEC is remarkably specific in its substrates. It um, predominantly, overwhelmingly phosphorylates one family of kinases called MAP Ks, or mitogen activated protein kinases, also serine threonine kinases. When those MAP kinases get activated, one class of preferred substrates for active MAP kinases, each one of these phosphorylation sites, I should also say, is an activating phosphorylation. So they get phosphorylated, they turn on, their enzymatic activity increases, and then they'll go and phosphorylate their 
downstream substrate. The downstream substrates of MAP kinases, among others, are a collection of transcription factors whose ability to promote gene transcription in the nucleus is positively regulated by phosphorylation. And that can be for uh, reasons of localization. So there are ones that get phosphorylated and go into the nucleus. There are ones that bind DNA more tightly when they're phosphorylated. There are transcription factors um, that are stabilized. Otherwise, they may be degraded. But when they get phosphorylated, they're stabilized in the cells and their uh, abundance increases. But the end result of this cascade when it gets activated is increased transcription factor activity and genes transcribed in the nucleus. Just a few words on RAS, what you need to know for today. There'll be more on this later. Heterotrimeric G proteins and these small monomeric G proteins, they both bind GTP. They're in the active state when they're bound to GTP, and they're in the inactive state when they're bound to G, when they, that GTP is hydrolyzed to G, GDP. Another common theme, there's differences in the kinetics and the timing, more on that later. But for today, what you need to know is that the G alpha, as well as the, um, uh, the gamma subunit, the beta, uh, the beta gamma, are constitutively localized to the plasma membrane, as are these monomeric G proteins. They have a tether that keeps them embedded in, uh, on the surface of the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane, and we'll explain why at the end of the lecture. So always localized at the plasma membrane. And what we'll speak about is that in Newman syndrome, there is another protein that is apparently localized to the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane that gives rise to the pathology. So let's set the broader stage for protein trafficking. Cartoon of the cell, we have all these organelles those organelles have specialized, compartmentalized functions. Part of that specialization in the compartmentalization is to be able to put certain proteins inside the organelles, on the surface of the organelles, here but not there. How is that accomplished at the biomolecular level, at the sequence level, and at the regulatory level in cell? And where we're going to start is with a 5,000-foot overview of protein traffic and protein um, movements related to localization inside the cell. Two big categories when we're talking about moving proteins out of the cell or bringing proteins into the cell. And these relate to a couple of organelles that were introduced very early on in the class, but we haven't said very much about since. When we're talking about Translation of proteins that ultimately will get secreted. Overall, this is a, a form of transport inside the cell called enterograde transport. So from the site of protein synthesis, where secreted proteins are made, to all of the different uh, places that they visit along the way to exiting the cell. As we will discuss, translation of these secreted proteins starts on the surface of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. It's rough because it's studded with ribosomes, and we know that ribosomes translate genes now. And then they move through another uh, organelle called the Golgi apparatus. We're going to give some molecular details about what occurs in the Golgi apparatus. And then they traffic to smaller vesicles, set secretory vesicles, that then fuse with the plasma membrane through a process called exocytosis. So membrane, uh, excuse me, vesicle fuses with the membrane. The contents of that vesicle, the interior, the interior called a lumen. I might say lumen a couple times. I don't know if it's blue on one of these forthcoming slides. And then the contents are released into the extracellular space. Also, anything that was in that vesicular membrane is now fused with the plasma membrane, is now on the cell surface. This entire process can run in reverse. The overall reverse process is called a retrograde transport. Now you're starting from outside of the cell and working 
one's way in. Exocytosis, bringing things outside of the cell. Endocytosis, bringing it back in. So there are buds that form on the plasma membrane, bring in a, a vesicle as an endosome. And that endosome can uh, mature, form lysosomes, those hydrolases, and things get digested. Or in certain conditions, traffic backwards to things like the Golgi and the ER. Recall that there were certain toxins that exploit these types of retrograde pathways after endocytosis, botulinum toxin, ricin. We'll zoom in to begin at this retrograde transport and endocytosis itself. Probably a bit mysterious how you have a nice, you can see it to be a smooth plasma membrane and then all of a sudden you get this invaginations cup here forming to be able to pinch something off and form one of these uh, early endosomes. How is that mediated? It's mediated by physically through uh, what's called a uh, clathrin coated pit. And they were called pits uh, because that's what they looked like, uh, like a hole in the ground or a, you know, a pit of a plum or something like that, big dark electron dense spots on the plasma membrane surface that investigators could observe by electron microscopy. It wasn't until later specialized so-called freeze fracture um, approaches like the one that's shown here, rip the cell apart at the plasma membrane and then do the electron microscopy. You could see what was in fact caging that pit. And this is this cage forming around that invagination and creating a biophysical driving force for the membrane to invaginate, as I showed in the cartoon before. And that cage is made up of a self-assembled protein called clathrin. Clathrin uh, is a uh, heterohexameric protein. It has three heavy chains and three light chains, one fully assembled clathrin is shown here in red. And it's a, so it's a three-membered assembly. And those three, the three heavy and the three light, when they come together, they form something akin to a tripod. Right? There's a curvature associated with it. It's not a flat triangle laid down on the slide or on a piece of paper. There's a little bit of uh, pitch to it. And as they self-assemble on the plasma membrane, with that pitch and that curvature, you start pulling in the plasma membrane as the clathrin self-assembles. And that cage, the self-assembly of clathrin, is called a triskelion skeleton, tri, three-membered skeleton around the outside of the vesicle. And as the clathrin continues to assemble, you'll eventually form a whole ball right, of the triskelion surrounding the membrane. So that gets you to the invagination step. It's initiated on the plasma membrane through a class of proteins uh, called adapter proteins. First thing, adapter proteins refers to any category of protein that does stuff like what I'm going to describe to you. It's not unique to the clathrin mediated. You'll hear about other adapter proteins in um, later lectures. But what adapter proteins are generally are uh, proteins that are able to bring together two other proteins that otherwise wouldn't interact with one another. And what the adapter proteins here are bringing together is clathrin and transmembrane receptors on the plasma membrane surface that are transmitting information to the cell to internalize, to, to become endocytosed. An example would be a receptor binds its ligand. That ligand leads to a conformational change of the receptor on the plasma membrane surface. Could activate a kinase, could give rise to some other type of um, uh, molecular assembly on the plasma membrane surface. Allosteric change on the intracellular domain. Any of those things could be the signal to recruit one of these adapters. And that adapter likes to bind clathrin. Now you have a lot of active receptor on the plasma membrane surface. Adapter 
recruited to those activated receptors. And then because the adapter is serving its adapter function, it's recruiting clathrin, mon uh, clathrin monomers, which are the three the six-membered uh, units, to the plasma membrane. And that process of receptor activation, adapter recruitment, clathrin self-assembly is called receptor-mediated endocytosis. Right? It's the receptor binding to its ligand that triggers the uh, clathrin self-assembly and endocytosis. Here's another cartoon of the self-assembly. Receptor binds the ligand. Oftentimes, these ligand-bound receptors will cluster, aggregate with, with one another. You'll get these adapters recruiting clathrin, and you get the formation of the coated pit, which is up to this, this point here. However, the triskelions are only enough to form like an apple, if you will, on the, on the interior of the membrane. They can't finish the deal, so to speak, and get that, end, uh, that invagination and turn it into an endocytic vesicle. What's required is a, a GTPase, so a GTP hydrolyzing enzyme, and in fact, a, a motor by several people's definitions, called dynamin. And what dynamin does basically goes apple picking. Okay, so we have this thing hanging off the membrane, and it has a twisting activity. Go to Carter, Carter Mountain, whatever, like this, right? That's what it does. That's the motor activity. GTP hydrolysis, nope. And now you have an endocytic vesicle. So because of the dynamin activating, pinching off these invaginations, now you have an endocytic vesicle. Once that uh, vesicle has internalized, the clathrin disassembles, all right, the adapters, the receptors stop getting activated. So all of the things start running in reverse that were triggered on the plasma membrane, uncoating. And re uh, recall, this was said very early in the class, but one of the things that's different between endosomes and, and then maturing into lysosomes is that you have the pHs dropping all this time. Right? There are uh, proton pumps on endosomal membranes that are pumping protons, lowering the pH of these endocytic vesicles as they're maturing from early endosomes, late endosomes, endolysosomes, lysosomes. That pH change can disrupt electrostatic interactions that may be providing the interacting force between the ligand and the receptor to begin with. Uh, ionic uh, bonds, right, from the beginning of the class. Once you start messing around with those by lowering the pH, many receptor ligand interactions will fall apart. And remarkably, the cell has the ability to separate the unbound receptors from the unbound ligands and, and traffic them, route them to different places inside the cell. If the receptor and ligand fall apart, that unbound receptor can get trafficked back to the plasma membrane, recycle, recycling, there's the cells recycle too. It saves a lot of energy, right? Because you don't have to remake that, uh, that receptor anymore. You can use it multiple times for ligand binding. And if the ligand is a nutrient or something, it will get continue to get degraded by lysosomal mediated hydrolysis. There are also variants that do things such as transcytosis. We're talking about a polarized epithelium. You need to have things come in on the apical side and exit on the basolateral side. Similar processes. All the details vary for the trafficking, um, but the, the processes uh, are the same. How are we doing on endocytosis and trafficking? If we're ready, we'll move on now to the other side. That's the essence of what you need to know for retrograde transport. Now, anterograde transport. And we're going to start with the life of a secreted or transmembrane protein which, as I mentioned, begins at the rough ER over here. And we will talk about that first. I forgot about one overview slide that I need to give you. Uh, 
there are a couple of rules of thumb for localization. We're going to do a deep dive with the ones that go out to the plasma and the marine surface. Uh, but we're gonna, I need to step back and introduce the broad categories of ways in which proteins can get moved from one location to another. The first broad category of protein localization and trafficking inside the cell occurs while the protein itself is being translated. This is called co-translational import. And this is the type of protein trafficking that occurs for the proteins that begin at the roughly endoplasmic reticulum and end up either secreted or on the plasma membrane surface. This is also the fate of proteins that end up within the lumen interior of lysosomes. And you'll hear more about that soon. There are other proteins that move to different locations inside the cell after they've been translated, after they've been translated in the cytosol by free ribosomes. And uh, this category of trafficking is called post-translational import. This is what takes place for proteins that localize to the nucleus or proteins that localize to the mitochondria. What's true for both of these types of localization uh, regimes is that there are sequences in the amino acids encoded by the protein that act as signals to determine whether or not that protein goes via a, a co-translational import route or a post-translational import route. So a few quick rules of thumb here, because we say, oh, traffic here, traffic there, traffic whatever. You need these signals. If a, an encoded protein has none of the stuff that I'm going to talk with you about today, the protein is going to go to the cytoplasm. So default is a cytoplasmically localized protein. Proteins that are directed for co-translational import have a, an amino acid sequence on their end terminus, so right at the beginning of the translated polypeptide, called a signal sequence that conveys information to the translational machinery that this uh, protein is going to undergo co-translational import. If there's nothing else other than the signal sequence, that co-translational import imported protein will either end up on the plasma membrane, if it's a transmembrane protein, st stuck to the surface of the plasma membrane as a peripheral membrane protein, or secreted into the extracellular space. There are additional targeting sequences, which I'll touch on, that can move it to other places, such as the lysosome. For post-translational import, there are other categories of sequences. They could be located anywhere within the translated polypeptide sequence. And the uh, the sequences that localize proteins to the nucleus are called nuclear localization sequences. Makes you smile when it's self-explanatory, right? or NLSs. And if they're going to the mitochondrial, they have MTSs, mitochondrial targeting sequences. The themes for NLSs and MTSs are, this, are pretty similar. We're going to emphasize the nucleocytoplasmic shuttling um, and, and just I mentioned the mitochondrial targeting for completeness. And the last rule of thumb you should know is that if you have a protein that doesn't have any of uh, these uh, localization, targeting sequences, or signal sequences, let's just say it's a default cytoplasmic protein. If it's small, small meaning lower than, uh, less than, let's say, 40 kilodaltons, it will diffuse freely between the cytoplasm and the nucleus. You'll see why when we talk about nuclear pores, they're a selectively permeable barrier between the nucleus and the cytoplasm. But if the protein's small enough, they can sneak right through there. It doesn't, doesn't matter. So we'll begin here with the co-translational import. It's probably the most complicated. Co-translational import. When translation starts, it starts in the cytoplasm 
because the particular polysome, the ribosome that's assembling, has no forward knowledge, if you will, what, what type of protein it's going to be translated. It just finds the cap, does the forward search, assembles the 40S and the 60S, and then starts translating. This is where we are at step one. So it's gone through the 5' prime untranslated region. It's starting to translate the polypeptide. And now the ribosome encounters a signal sequence right on the end terminus. When that signal sequence is translated as a polypeptide, it is recognized by a protein called SR SRP, which stands for signal recognition particle. So the signal sequence binds the signal recognition particle. And upon recruitment and binding of SRP, this is a, a trigger to bring that ribosome and the mRNA and the SRP to the surface of the endoplasmic reticulum. On the surface of the endoplasmic reticulum, this is an organelle. It has a membrane. In the ER membrane, there is a receptor for signal recognition particle called the SRP receptor. So SRP bound to the uh, signal sequence, which is bound to the ribosome and the mRNA, gets pulled to the ER membrane, binds to this, the SRP receptor. And this SRP receptor is in a complex with a, a receptor for the ribosome to keep that uh, complex bound to the ER membrane surface, and a um, heterocomplex called a pore protein that forms a pore in the ER membrane. I'll show that crystallographically in a slide or two. The pore is where tr transmembrane and secreted proteins will get threaded through to end up entirely or partly in the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. Starting from here, the SRP bound to the SRP receptor. Translation continues to occur, but upon docking here, there's a GTP hydrolysis event that passes the signal sequence, signal peptide, um, from SRP into this pore complex and translation now, it's threaded now in through the pore. Translation, translation, threading, threading, threading the polypeptide through until a stop sequence, a stop, um, a, a stop codon is encountered, a release factor, all that stuff from last quarter. And then at the end of translation, the ribosome disassembles, just like we spoke about before. The whole complex falls apart. And there's a, a peptidase in this complex, SRP receptor, pore protein, ribosome receptor, that will clip off that signal peptide, giving rise to, in this case, a, a mature poly, a polypeptide that was now entirely in the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. The lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum, as you'll see inside, that's topologically equivalent to the outside of the cell. So we just have to traffic pieces of ER membrane through various organelles. We get it to a secretory vesicle, fuses with the plasma membrane surface, and now this translated protein is released into the extracellular space. Here's what it looks like in a ribbon diagram. You've already seen these. I don't know if this works. No, it doesn't work. Uh, ribosome here. Here's the pore complex. Uh, the SRP bound uh, here. What I want to zoom in here is the pore protein itself. I'm not going to distract myself with the movies. It's a heterotrimeric complex that forms the pore. And these individual subunits in the pore complex and the pore protein are very dynamic. So keep that in mind when I show the subsequent cartoons, because there are things that can actually move out of the pore and into the membrane, and it's thought to relate to the conformational flexibility of these different subunits in the pore protein. 
the cartoon from before walked through all of the steps to get to a protein that has a signal sequence, one signal sequence, and that's it, yielding a, a mature polypeptide that will be secreted from the cell. What about transmembrane proteins? They follow a very similar route with one little wrinkle. Remember these uh, hydro, hy, uh, hydropathy plots in the, lower, in, the, in the quarter? Long stretches of hydrophobic amino acids that if they're long enough and contiguous enough with one another, thermodynamically they're going to end up in, the, in, a, in a membrane if they can span the membrane. These get translated in real time by the ribosome, which regrettably is gone. There should be a ribosome here translating. Right? When the translation is occurring, here you're already bet loaded up to the pore protein. Right? Already have translated the signal peptide, threading through. Now you encounter, uh, the ribosome encounters a stretch of 20 hydrophobic amino acids. Those hydrophobic amino acids act as what's called you know, depending upon you know, which jargon you're familiar with, either a stop transfer or a topogenic sequence, which means that basically stop localizing the protein where you're currently localizing it and change from the ribosome's perspective where you're translating the mRNA. So the ribosome would ordinarily be here, translating, translating, hits one of these topogenic sequences. It's hydrophobic. It's not thermodynamically favorable for it to continue to get threaded into the lumen of the ER. That's as, just as hydrophilic of an environment as the cytoplasm. So it gets stuck, if you will, in the pore protein. And here's where that conformational flexibility of the heterotrimer is important. The thinking is that that hydrophobic sequence then weaves its way out of the pore and into the ER membrane, where it's thermodynamically favorable. Once this uh, stop transfer sequence has navigated out of the pore protein, the ribosome undocks from the ER membrane and continues translating the rest of the polypeptide, but now in the cytoplasm. And it's sort of stuck by the rest of the sequence to the, the plasma membrane, but it's translating in essence in the cytoplasm. I have a lot of notes on this slide. I just want to check to make sure I got everything. Any, any questions on uh, signal sequences, stop transfer sequences? Yes? Wait, good question. Is the signal sequence that signal peptide, how is it getting recognized by SRP? It is in the primary sequence. So one can look at the inferred translated polypeptide. And if you see the, the consensus signal sequence there, you say this is gonna go, this is gonna go to the ER and get translated there. Mm -hmm. uh, this process of recognition is transmembrane proteins in the Another good question. a clarification. So you're asking, I'm talking about getting a transmembrane protein in the endoplasmic reticulum. I'll be rude to myself. What on earth does that have to do with transmembrane proteins on the plasma membrane? In fact, this is how the plasma membrane transmembrane proteins are translated. They start on the ER, in the ER membrane, and then as you'll see in later cartoons, you have budding events of ER membrane that go to these or other organelles and eventually become secretory vesicles. But the membrane originally in that transmembrane protein was first translated on the ER membrane, and then it gets trafficked. We focused on the translational events that are occurring in the rough end endoplasmic reticulum. There's also a lot of things that are happening to the translated polypeptide post-translationally that are crucial for the function of the proteins after they've been translated. And these fall into different categories of what are called post-translational modifications. So post-translational means things that change the protein character after the protein translation has, has occurred. 
Separate from this slide, let me just give you a couple of examples of post-translational modifications that you already are aware of. Phosphorylation, meth uh, 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 lysine methylation, right? all of those happen after the histones or the protein substrates have been translated. It's a post-translational modification. Here are the major categories that occur in the ER. First is this is where disulfide bonds are formed. Oxidation, the free thiols on cysteines come together to form disulfides all the way back. Lecture one. This is where it occurs. It's an oxidizing environment. The formation of disulfide bonds are catalyzed by an enzyme called protein disulfide isomerase. That's a mouthful. And so what a disulfide isomerase does, an isomer means same, um, basically catalyzing the same type of chemical reaction, but just swapping the, the, the different isomers of that formation. So what it's doing is imagine that there's a disulfide bond between two thiols and a protein, but there may be 10 possible disulfide bonds that could form, because this one could get reduced, bound up here. This one could get reduced, bound down, down here. So protein disulfide isomerase is exploring different disulfide bond configurations to identify the one that's most thermodynamically favorable. So the one that's most thermodynamically favorable will be the one that's least likely to be reversed by disulfide isomerase, by protein disulfide isomerase. Folding of secreted proteins and the extracellular domain of transmembrane proteins occurs in the lumen of the ER. Some of this is by proper disulfide bond formation. Some of it is by virtue of, of several of the other post-translational modifications that I'll uh, speak about in a moment. If protein folding is screwed up, for example, if you take a cell and you just rev up the temperature much hotter than it ordinarily experiences, you've, you've screwed with thermodynamics. All right, so T is higher than it ordinarily should be. There's more wiggle than the cell has evolved to adapt to. Protein folding will get messed up. And when protein folding gets really messed up, protein translation stops. There's a dedicated unfolded protein response that gets engaged by the cells. And they'll stay in this stressed state, in many ways, uh, waiting for things to get better um, or trying to upregulate other proteins that can help fold under difficult circumstances like heat shock. If it's too severe, the cell dies. So we have folding, disulfide bonds, protein cleavages can occur specifically in the endoplasmic reticulum, harking back all the way to the example of disulfide bonds that I uh, gave to you in the first lecture. Insulin is it's a secreted protein, peptide hormone, synthesized, uh, translated on the rough ER. In the ER, it uh, is cleaved and then forms these disulfides to form the mature active uh, hormone. The cleavage occurs in the ER. In addition, uh, very complicated proteins, more elaborate assemblies can occur between multiple gene products in the endoplasmic reticulum. The one that immediately comes to mind for number four are antibodies. Heavy chain, light chain, two different loci, VJ, VDJ recombination may get translated the pairing of heavy and light chains with all of those inter uh, intermolecular disulfide bonds, ER. And then the final thing, which you've heard nothing about up to this point, is uh, the addition and modification of proteins with sugars, carbohydrates. And that carbohydrate modification that occurs post-translationally in the ER and later organelles, such as the Golgi apparatus. It's a process called glycosylation. So how are we gonna sweeten up these proteins? All right, so we have a couple of different places, ways in which you can add sugars to uh, put proteins in the endoplasmic reticulum and then also in the Golgi. Two main categories. Uh, for, first, uh, 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 an opening remark. These sugar modifications, we're going to talk about big ones and small ones. They're, they're, none of them would be considered 
polymers. They're going to have a finite number of units on them, a few to maybe a dozen, a dozen and a half, something like this. And so collectively, these are oligosaccharide modifications. Polysaccharides involved in metabolism. We'll talk about some of those in uh, next week. But for these um, glycosylation events that occur on proteins in the ER, they are covalent modifications that occur on two residues. One is um, they're conjugated to the hydroxyls, O-linked glycosylation events. And it's the O, the hydroxyl, the OH, hanging off serines or threonines on the translated protein that form the site for the sugar conjugation and then uh, elaboration from there. Those glycosylation events are on the shorter end. Here's an example here, serine, hydroxyl, and then these are individual uh, sugars. None of those are blue. It's a total acronym nightmare. If I tell you this is N-acetylgalactosamine, that you have, I haven't relayed anything, but this is what it stands for, right? Galactose, oops, N-acetylmiraminic acid. Um, but these all branch together, and I'll show a cartoon of that in a moment. We can link sugars to O's. We can link sugars to free amines. And the amine that um, is the branch point for e the so-called N-link oligosaccharides is on asparagine. You have an asparagine here. You, you uh, engage a different type of sugar modifications early on. You can see this is GALNAC, this is GLICNAC, so N-acetylglucosamine. This creates a different point for these subsequent uh, sugar modifications. They can be linear at some point. They can be branched at other points. And all of this code underneath it, you can see the alpha 2, 3, beta 1, 4. The, the, um, the reason why the protein glycosylation is kind of a mess is that each one of those sugars has a number of hydroxyl sites, O's, where you can branch things off of and do modifications on. And not only are the uh, combinatorial complexities rather large, each individual protein that gets translated, the extent of glycosylation on that protein is not stereotyped. So you could have the same, um, let's give an example, insulin that has some gly is glycosylated. One translated polypeptide of insulin going through the ER and through the Golgi will have sugars on it. Another one that goes through the exact same cell with the same path will have a slightly different extent of sugar modifications on it. Overall, it'll be similar, but it will not be identical. And so this non-identicality of the protein uh, modifications, if you try to study these glycosylated proteins, they usually have a broad molecular weight distribution reflecting the broad extent of sugar modifications that occurred as they were being translated. This process of glyc glycosylation starts, is nucleates in the ER, but it, a lot of the uh, more extensive elaborations take place in the Golgi apparatus. So you start in the lumen of the ER, once little uh, vesicles of ER bud off of the endoplasmic reticulum and traffic to the Golgi, it's here where these, these more extensive um, addition and removal of sugars occur as one goes from the cis Golgi, which is the earlier portion of this, the Golgi stacks, to the medial portion to the trans Golgi. Each one of these uh, stacks is, um, has different localization of enzymes, these sugar modifying enzymes, and the proteins are getting trafficked through them as they proceed along. At the end, there is a decision of these vesicles to be routed either to the plasma membrane, to lysosomes, more to come on that in a moment, or to these secretory vesicles, like I had said before, just to reside there and not get exocytosed unless there's a particular trigger for them to occur. Because everything that makes its way to the plasma membrane has to go through the ER and the Golgi. If there are available sites for N and O-linked glycosylation, those proteins will be sugar modified. Therefore, 
at the end, if you look at all of the things that are on the surface of the plasma membrane, there's going to be a lot of sugar modifications on the outside of the cell. This sugar coating of the outside of uh, uh, eukaryotic cells is called the glycocalyx, and it refers generally to all of the sugar-modified biomolecules that are on the, uh, extra, the outer leaflet of the plasma membrane. And that arises by virtue of the enzymes that localize to the ER and the Golgi. Is it about this part of the lecture? <laughs> a lot of stuff. Why do I care about any of this? Um, when I started lecturing, it, this was, I was also laboring through this. But this happened in my lab, and so this is, helped me. We know about glycosylation. I have to teach it to you all. And it's a, a nice little vignette to remind some of the things that you saw from before, um, immunoblotting, Western blots, protein biochemistry, all that stuff. We showed you a lot of cartoons of ban white glows, and then you just see it. It never works out that way. Usually, usually when you try to you, you buy a $300, $400 antibody and you stain for something, we were, had a project interested in this secreted protein called GDF11. You do the Western blot, everything to code, aminoblotting, and you see this. What, if anything, is GDF11? So I said, okay, let's buy another antibody, spend another $300, $400, do the experiment again, and now we see this. All right, well, all right, what do we do? Well, so fortunately what we did was what we looked, we noticed that some of these, um, we knew that the molecular, and actually several of these, any of the places where we saw the bands, the bands didn't co coincide with what the predicted molecular weight of the protein was supposed to be. So there wasn't anything that was really localized to what we were interested in. So we looked at the sequence, and it turns out that the, the nascent polypeptide has one site for N-linked glycosylation. So, oh, there's maybe a little, maybe we can see some hazes on there. Maybe there's a haze on the blood. We don't appreciate it. Maybe we can help clarify this. So what we did is you can take the protein extracts and treat them with a whole cocktail of enzymes called deglycosidases. I hope you can all infer what those do. They chop off all the sugars and go on to the protein. So we just deglycosidase the entire mixture. And then we run the deglycosidated, the deglycosylated mixture on the blot and see if anything changed and anything clean up. Here are the same two antibodies. We did this by fluorescence. So it's two colors, so we can keep track of the individual colors. For this clone, here is a band that is hazy, smeared out, non-stereotyped glycosylation, and it's migrating more slowly because of all the sugar that's on it, uh, slower electrophoretic mobility. We chew away all of the sugars, and now we see a nice big fat band here right at the predicted molecular weight of this protein. That's great. Even cooler was this uh, monoclonal antibody where we didn't see anything except when we deglycosylated. So when we treated with the deglycosylation mix, now the band appears and it co-localizes perfectly with the other uh, antibody. And so what our inference was, which we eventually published, is that all of those sugar residues were obscuring the epitope that that antibody recognized. So we want to go and get in there, but since there are all these sugars, it couldn't access the epitope on the protein that would be able to recognize it, except it only cleaved it off. And in fact, we exploited this property to use the, the, the antibody on the right-hand side um, in a pretty shrewd way to get indication of processing and the maturation of this factor in tumors and tissues and cells, leveraging glycosylation. All right, if, I if that's not, I like that story. If you don't like that story, that's fine. But maybe you, you've heard of blood types. A, B, O, A, B. These are all fundamentally glycosylation dependent signatures. And we'll explain why. Blood type is a story of one gene and three variants. And so the, um, the cartoon here shows the sugar modification and it, and it occurs on lipids, but this also, this sugar modification also occurs on proteins. And the gene here 
can come in three different variants. If you have the, the and the gene is an enzyme. If you have the A allele for this enzyme, it encodes a GALNAC transferase, meaning when you have this sugar residue as a substrate, it will catalyze the covalent addition of N-acetylgalactosamine at the position that's shown here. This A allele gives rise to the A antigen and the A blood type, because this sugar scaffold here is very common, so you get a lot of A antigen on everything, your blood, your tissues, and everything. Conversely, if one of your copies of this enzyme is the B allele, it doesn't uh, encode for a GALNAC transferase, it encodes for a galactose transferase, instead putting this sugar modification on the same scaffold. If both of them are broken, if you have the allele that has a frame shift mutation in it and doesn't encode any enzyme at all, that's the O antigen meaning you have neither this nor this. And that's why the O blood, meaning two copies of the O allele, can be tolerized by anybody with different blood types, because it, it doesn't have this epitope here that can be the uh, target for immune attack. If you're interested about positive, negative, the rhesus factor, totally different thing. It's a chloride transporter. It's, an, it's another compatibility group. But this one has to do with sugar, which is why we talk about it. I'm going to mention one last thing related to sugars, related to targeting, and related to co-translational import. And this is how you get uh, luminal proteins in the Golgi to localize to the lysosome. What types of enzymes do we want to localize to the lysosome? Those acid hydrolases that will chew up the contents that are inside those, uh, uh, inside those organelles. Break them down, peptides, proteins, use them from, um, as a nutrient source. How do we get lysosomal hydrolases targeted to the lumen of the lysosome? There is a post-translational modification that involves sugar, but it's a different kind of sugar called nanose 6-phosphate. Nanose 6-phosphate is, and this goes back to the question on signal sequence, is it a linear signal sequence? Here is an example of uh, encoding information about protein trafficking that is not in the primary sequence. This is a, there is a tertiary patch on the mature folded protein called, of, of these lysosomal hydrolases called a signal patch that is recognized by the enzymes that conjugate nanose 6-phosphate on proteins that have that signal patch. So it's a protein fold, a pocket, a little bulge on the, on the protein, recognized by those enzymes, and then tagged it with mannose 6-phosphate. Once there's a mannose 6-phosphate on these lysosomal hydrolases, that modification is recognized by a receptor, the mannose 6-phosphate receptor, inward-facing receptor towards the lumen of the Golgi, minus the mannose 6-phosphate receptor. Now it's receptor-mediated trafficking, but almost, I don't want to say inside out, it's to topologically the same as if it's on the plasma membrane. Nanose 6-phosphate binds its receptor. And now what goes on those, uh, uh, what assembles on those membranes, it's not clathrin, but another self-assembling protein that's important for trafficking called codimer. And codimer forms its own coated pit on the, uh, the distal Golgi, the trans, trans Golgi network gets butted off, and as a result of the codimer, that is recognized by different trafficking proteins that will fuse those vesicles with lysosomes, or endolysosomes as they're maturing to form full-blown lysosome. Any questions? Okay. I will see you on Thursday. We pick up from here.